yeah, as we come to the end of our unconventional convention, I think we, um, we, we can all agree that it's been a really exciting weekend again. And if you've been able to meet in person at a hub, um, I hope you had a wonderful day yesterday. And if not, you were able to watch that on the live stream and then watch the showcases today. I'm sure you all agree that there's been a great effort by the team behind the scenes and it's been a really good weekend. Um, I just want to officially record my thanks, if I may, to all the judges and the education and judging team who have made this possible this afternoon for this session, um, but also by facilitating and working and helping out at the various hub um, meetings that we had yesterday. Um, I'm not going to name them all individually. If you were at one of the hubs, you'll know who they were. And if you weren't, well, you probably don't care anyway. So, um, but anyway, a big thanks to all the people that did help out there from the education and judging team. So really appreciate your support. So this afternoon is about getting back to singing. And we've got a variety of people here um, who will be introduced individually as we go along, but who all bring a slightly different experience to this topic. And so um, I'm gonna sort of, sort of pass over now to our education officer, Alison Thompson, who is going to introduce uh, the individuals who will be speaking and facilitate any discussion that we have thereafter. So I hope you all enjoy the session, probably be about 45 minutes, depending on how enthusiastic you are in your discussions. So I'll hand over to Alison now and thank you all very much for being here. Alison? Thank you. Um, oh, goodness me, there I am spotlighted. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so I'll be chairing the panel today and the panel that we have for you, uh, we have a music judge, which is Emma Shanks. She's the lab's music judge, waving at you with a beautiful rainbow sequence behind her. We have um, Alex De Bruin, also a music judge. We have Dallas Knight, also a music judge. There's the theme here, isn't there? And then we have Craig, Craig Kehoe, who is a singing judge. Yay for singing. Woo! Yay for singing. Woo! And I'm a singing judge too, and I might be putting my two paneth in. But we have no hope for performance, but that doesn't matter at all. But we're going to kick off the discussion with Emma telling us about her experience in this field, the safe return to rehearsals. So unspotlight me, please, Mike. That's better. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Alison. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for coming along. What you know, it's the end of unconventional convention. It's that last session of the day. Um, outside of barbershop world, when I'm not being a lab's music judge or indeed singing of any description, I actually work for the health and safety executive, um, which is the uh, regulator of health and safety in the workplace. Now, you might be saying to yourself, oh, but we're not at work when we're singing. Well, that's possibly one of the things that's up for debate. However, where I come into this picture is, um, I was actually, um, members of my team were the people that picked up the phone when HSC first issued um, a phone number for um, way back in March, 2020. My, yeah, it was March, 2020, when coronavirus first locked us down. And um, there was a phone number put out and it was for um, people like the health service and the workplaces, the blue light services, and so on to be able to speak to somebody who knew about that acronym that we now know all what it means PPE uh, personal protective equipment and how effective it was what it's going to do and so on and so forth and for for many many months a lot of my team were um, I say it like they're, they're my employees they're not we're all part of the same team um, but they yeah for many months they were literally on the end of the phone from seven in the morning till 11 at night um, once a particular uh, issue had been resolved, we were then able to put out um, much clearer guidance. But there's been a lot of talk about PPE, the effectiveness of PPE. What is a mask? What isn't a mask? What is a community face covering? What isn't a community face covering? There's been guidelines issued by the World Health Organization, as well as HSC and as well as other European equivalents of HSC um, across the continent. Um, one of the things you may or may not be aware of is that COVID or coronavirus is in fact RIDOR reportable. So RIDOR is the reporting of infectious diseases and dangerous occurrences regulations. So if you're in a workplace and there is an outbreak of coronavirus, then it does have to be reported under those regs. Um, one of the things that has really struck me about this whole evolving situation over the past, well, it's more than 18 months now, isn't it? Um, is that 
the general public is seeing research being played out live, real time. And it's not something that the general public often sees. What we as general public, and I'm gonna put myself in general public there rather than uh, as a research scientist, which is my day job. Um, what we generally see is the end result of lots and lots and lots of stuff that's gone on in the background, lots of pieces of research, lots of little bits being done by lots of different um, stakeholders. And then all of that gets put together into a final report. And then that's what we see on the headlines. But that's not what has happened with coronavirus. What has happened is you've been, we have been fed little bits of information as they've become available. And what you're seeing is the longitudinal study of coronavirus, how it can, um, how the risk can be mitigated, how the how it transmits in the workplace, all those sorts of things. Is, we're seeing that evolve in real time. So every time Prof Chris Whitty has been doing his Downing Street briefings, that is brand new data. And a lot of that data is stuff that has come through my organization as well. So HSC, the Health and Safety Executive, um, is leading on one of what one of six national core studies on coronavirus. And the particular strand that we're leading is the uh, transmission of COVID in the workplace. And that has involved going to workplaces where there has been uh, reported COVID outbreaks or reported under Riddle and inviting those employers to actually take part in a study. So that means that we, and I put myself there because I've actually been to some of these workplaces over the past few months, go into these workplaces and we're doing PCR tests on people, taking blood samples. I don't do that. The bloods people do that. Um, and then following them up six weeks later with more bloods and then trying to almost map how that, how the virus is spread within that particular workplace. And all of this ties back to one of HSE's core things, which is risk assessment. And I, it's sometimes that thing where you go, oh, I don't wanna to have to do a risk assessment. What's the five steps of risk assessment? Oh, but you know what? Putting the work in beforehand to be able to determine a what the hazards are who's going to be affected by it and how you can control it takes and it does take effort but it is so worth it because it further down the line it just means that um basically your back's covered and you can demonstrate due diligence and you can demonstrate that you have thought about something um so it's kind of a lot of information in one go um, there's a lot more that I could say about the kind of the stuff that HSC has done and the stuff that I have been involved in, but I'm sure a lot more of that will come out as we um, progress this afternoon. So I shall leave it there for, for, for now, Alison. Thank you very much, Emma. That was really enlightening. No idea <laughs> at all. <laughs> so I'm handing over to Alex now and he's going to talk to us about some more sciencey stuff. Yes, indeed. Um, thank you very much, Alison. And um, kind of in a similar vein to Emma, I also in my non barbershop life, am a research scientist and I um, work in a field that encompasses things like the, um, the, the concept of aerosols and fine particles and things floating around in the air and also air quality. So um, what I've um, had a part in with um, various choruses that I'm in in some manner of leadership capacity I've been able to advise them on how to measure whether there is enough ventilation for example in a room now with with Covid like remember when when the world first unlocked a little bit and we could meet again singers could only meet outside and that is because outside is very well ventilated um, and outside um, and what I'm going to start talking about now, just to warn you, here's some numbers coming at you. Um, and outside, we have a level of carbon dioxide that is about 400 parts per million. Now, carbon dioxide is what happened is what is a gas that is emitted when we breathe out and can be used in a sealed room to measure um, or at least in an inside room. It can be used to measure how well that room is is ventilated how good the airflow is in that room and um you can see basically if a person is sat in a room like if i'm sat in this office for a long time that level of co2 rises and rises and rises because it's raining outside and i don't want to open the window now this is all great and good co2 is not the enemy here what is what is dangerous is the um potential for um the covid 
aeros the COVID containing aerosols to kind of stay stuck in a room where they can then be breathed in by somebody else. And um, what we tend to do, what we've, um, I've been advising choruses to do is use a CO2 meter that can measure the um, levels of CO2. And from that level of CO2, that's then um, whether you've got good ventilation in the room. Now, outside, as I say, was 400. And then um, in a well-ventilated room, um, you want to be under 800. Um, and occasionally that might drift up to maybe um, if you're in a small room with lots of people, that can go up to 3,000. Now, obviously, that's way beyond what we want. But um, out of kind of a conservative estimate, we want our CO2 levels to be below 800. And what that means is the air is um, flowing through the room. And as the air flows into the room, the COVID particles that may or may not have existed if one of our other control measures has failed, um, those COVID particles are taken out with that air. So we've been um, using CO2 uh, monitors, um, both when my chorus has been rehearsing outside, outside in masks, outside without masks, inside with masks, inside without masks, on risers, etc. And being able to have that little machine that goes ping has been uh, really helpful for us being able to do that. And um, Yes, I'm, I'm happy to say that we've not had any any um, cases at all within our within my chorus. So um, that that's a good, good start with that. Um, but yes, I, I, I very much enjoy a little machine that goes ping. Um, <laughs> as is my want. So yeah, that is me. Thank you very much, Alex. That's, um, I knew about CO2 monitors, but nobody actually explained to me why it was a good idea. And now I know and we'll get on the Internet later. <laughs> so thank you very much. So we're going to hear from Delith tonight now. Um, slightly different perspective, I think, talking particularly about risk assessments. who also has a very keen um, legal brain, so can come up with some de definitions about workplaces and things. <laughs> Off you go, Deli. Well, thank you, Alison. Yeah, like Emma and Alex, this is nothing to do with being a music judge whatsoever. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to say to you, the thing to do if, if you're like me, a, a chairman of a club, and you have to evaluate your return to live rehearsals, um, then where you start is making music. We're all members of Making Music. They have the most fabulous tools on their website. And I'm going to, I'm going to put their, their web address in the chat now. Um, so uh, uh, all I'm going to tell you today is pinched from their website. So I freely, fully and frankly admit to total plagiarism, which is not something I would ever recommend in any other circumstances, but they are very, very good. Um, there's guidance for carrying out a risk assessment there. There are templates for how you might uh, garner your information for, for, for performances as well as rehearsals. There's something called the Well Rehearsed Reporting app, which you can join. And if you do report whether or not you've had any COVID instances, then they will record that centrally. And I think they feed it back to the government. And what, what we learned from Babs was that there are very, very few reported instances of COVID being caught through live singing, which I felt was enormously encouraging. So whatever everybody is doing out there, we're doing good. Um, also making music on their website cover all four countries of the United Kingdom. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about England, but apologies to our Scottish friends. Um, there is guidance there for you, but your situation is not the same because you do things differently in Scotland. Um, but the, the guidance on, is on making music websites, so do please look at that. It's in the context of workplaces, but as what Emma said, we all sing in places which are people's workplaces. And therefore, it applies to the places where we sing unless you're in the open air. If you're indoors, these guidances apply. Um, 
So you must speak to your venue before you start doing a, a, a risk assessment because you may find they've done one already and hey, we're three steps further on. They will know about one-way systems. They can tell you how they keep their uh, social spaces clean, their corridors clean, the toilets clean and those sorts of things so that you know what you then have to take account of. Um, Emma and Alex have told you a little bit about how COVID-19 can be spread and essentially what you're trying to stop is anybody getting ill. The first way you stop somebody getting ill is you stop them coming to your rehearsals. So you need to find out from everybody whether they are clean and clear before they even set off. And that's by doing some sort of test. An LFT test is, is very often compulsory. And once they have arrived, oh, um, then you need to know what to do about it to make sure that nobody else gets infected. So you need to have some sort of means at the door to stop them coming in or to, to register who is there so that if somebody later discovers that they've been registered, then you can report it because as Emma said, it's a public reportable disease. And somebody in your organization needs to be the single point of contact for getting in touch with your local public health organization. So that's quite important. You need to know what you're doing. Um, the reason that you have to do it is because if you're on the, your club's management committee, you have a duty of care to everybody who walks in through the door. And that's whether you're a charity or not. If you're careless about people's uh, well-being, you know, you, you, you might be found responsible for something. I'll say that just, just in the very least, loosest of senses. Um, you wouldn't let spilt water lie on the floor. Um, you, you wouldn't willingly let somebody get scalded for boiling water when they're making tea for you. So why would you willingly put people in the way of getting infected by COVID? That's what we're all trying to stop. The trouble is um, that there's a kind of a whole range of personal attitudes that people have to this, ranging from the, the, the highly confident the people who are on the verge of being totally careless of what anybody else thinks, to the people who are perhaps seriously immunocompromised and could be at a horrible, horrible risk of catching something life-threatening if they set foot in your rehearsal, and they need to be encouraged that the measures that you're taking are, are going to be sufficient to protect them. Now, Everybody has a personal decision as to the level of risk that they take. And what you need as, a, as a, an organisation, as a club, is to demonstrate that you've taken certain steps in their interests. And that will be, what are the risks and how are we going to mitigate them? And the risks are, are as, as we all already know, we've been told for 18 months, the risk of spread through aerosols, the risk of spread through droplets, and the risk of spread through touching surfaces, which may or may not be such a risk. But those are the three essential risks, as I understand it, as a total layman for, from COVID. And how do you mitigate against those? Ventilation to keep changing the air, the wearing of masks and sanitization. You sanitize surfaces, you sanitize your hands regularly and keep washing them. We, we all know this. And I, I tell you what, what gives me huge pleasure is that what I've seen on the videos this afternoon through various showcases that everybody who's singing together is quite obviously well versed in all of these people are standing in front of spaced chairs or in little spots on the floor or little hockey pucks on the floor or whatever they were and they're well spaced out they're out of doors so you all know this you all know what it is that you have to do if you're called on as I have been with my uh, with my Babs Club now to do a risk assessment because we're starting live rehearsals in January. Um, go to Making Music, do the test there uh, uh, and, and follow their, um, their rationale. Um, but talk to your members all the time to find out what their varying levels of concern are about coming back together. Because if you find that there, there aren't very many who are happy, um, then your rehearsals are not going to be so successful. I'm quite sure that you all do that anyway, that you will have people who, who are bashing at the door to want to come back in masked or otherwise, and people who have still not come back because they're really seriously worried. 
as the organiser of the event, you then need to be very capable of accommodating the sorts of worries that there are. And if you don't know what the worries are, then you're not going to be able to accommodate them. So that's a lot of waffle from a very um, local point of view. I, I can see there's lots and lots of things going on in the chat, none of which I've read, so I shall do uh, that. I'm, going to, I'm <laughs> going to ask you a question from the chat, Dallas. Pushka's asked, how do they know that very few COVID cases are caught through live singing or have been caught through live singing? Because people report to making music through this app that's called Well Rehearsed, which you can download from, from their website. And they, they know how many cases have been reported. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dice. Really interesting. Um, okay, so we are now going to hear from Craig uh i've lost my notes because my phone's gone off practicalities and logistics of getting chorus singing again in person um and talking about the kind of the emotional response that delith's actually touched on there with the different views of different members of the chorus over to you craig thanks ali and good afternoon to everybody else on the call um, so yeah, hopefully this, my little section will tie in everything that Dennis, Emma and Alex have already talked about. Um, <clears throat> and you may find that what I'm saying to you is the same as what you have done in your own choruses, or it may be something completely different. So this is just what's worked with my chorus. Um, and if there's anything there you can take from it, then, then great. Um, what I will say beforehand is that before our chorus made any decisions, we did look at all the guidance made available by labs and babs and uh, making music. Uh, and we also attended lots of sort of Zoom sessions uh, that are on offer as well. Um, so um, I'll start with a bit of background then. Um, before we even sort of started to think about how we were going to get the chorus back together, we, we wanted to be as transparent as we could as a committee and as a music team so that our members felt part of the process. This was a process that was done with the members <clears throat> rather than to the members of the chorus. Um, and we, we decided that we would devise a roadmap uh, and that would be shared with the chorus um, at our AGM back in January. Um, and we wanted to ensure that everybody felt included. And that, in, that means that if you don't feel safe to come back to rehearsal, that's OK. And it still is OK to not feel safe to come back to rehearsal, um, either because you, you don't want to attend a rehearsal and sing in a mask or you know, you, you just don't feel as though your health is at a particular positive point yet. Whatever it is, not attending rehearsal is fine. Um, so the roadmap, and I actually I shared this roadmap with Labs at the uh, council meeting earlier on this year, and I think it's somewhere on the Labs website, but if anybody would like a copy, um, I'm happy to share it. Um, it was a four stage roadmap, um, and stage one was um, for section rehearsals to take place outdoors in groups of six where possible um, throughout April and May um, and in some sections where there was more than six in a section we split the section in half and then a section leader would take one half and a deputy section leader would take another half uh, and again Zoom uh, was used in those section rehearsals so anybody that didn't want to attend or couldn't attend a physical outdoor rehearsal could attend via Zoom uh, stage two were larger section rehearsals uh, that took part throughout May and June uh, and actually what we decided there was that we would do duet sectionals so we could start to hear some harmonies around us again um, and they were um, at the time we were allowed to meet in, in groups of greater than six so I think at one point we might have had 20 of us meeting outdoors um, obviously socially distanced um, in the safest possible way. Um, phase three uh, was full chorus rehearsals um, and I think a lot of us have um, uh, a lot of local football teams to thank for use of their stadiums. Um, we certainly um, thanked our local team for letting us use their stadium um, and we had half a dozen or so, maybe more, um, outdoor rehearsals with masks um, in a football stadium and that was throughout sort of July and August. Um, until the weather started to turn, which brought us to stage four, uh, which was tentatively back indoors with masks uh, with a, in a well-ventilated room with regular breaks, more than we would normally have, um, and obviously socially distanced. Um, what I would say is that our, our old venue couldn't house us 
for various reasons. So we became a little bit nomadic, as I'm sure some of you have as well. And we seem to have a different rehearsal venue every week um, for a little while. Um, so on to the sort of the inclusivity bit and how we feel that we are trying to support our members through this. Um, as I said before, no one's put under pressure to attend for any reason. If they don't want to, it's absolutely fine. Uh, we do record our rehearsals, audio record our rehearsals, and they get sent out to the members. Uh, and we still use Zoom, as I'm sure, again, many of you guys do as well. Uh, so members can check into the rehearsal on Zoom and, and take part in the rehearsal. Um, and um, members are asked to submit recordings. So we're learning, and I'm sure you are, we're learning lots of new songs. Um, and we ask all members to record themselves singing the, the new songs, send them to the section leaders so that they can get feedback uh, from their section leaders, which also enables those that aren't attending regularly to feel part of the chorus. They're still in the loop. They're still having that regular contact with a section leader and receiving feedback on how they're developing uh, their vocal skills. Um, I'm a teacher, so during half terms and holidays, etc., um, I try to send out a rehearsal recap. But if there's any other teachers <laughs> in the call, you'll know that that's not always possible, but with marking and planning and stuff. But I do try to review uh, the weeks as we go. Um, as I'm sure every chorus in the world now has a very vibrant WhatsApp group. Um, we have hundreds of WhatsApp groups in our chorus. Um, uh, and I think probably the most important WhatsApp groups are our section WhatsApp groups, where section leaders can catch up with members of their, their section each week. Um, we also have a gardening WhatsApp group. We have a bake-off WhatsApp group. We have a sewing needlework sort of WhatsApp group. So there's everything available. Um, uh, and our, our regular non-attenders, so those that we haven't seen much of at all, um, they're contacted specifically by our membership manager who I was hoping actually was going to be on today but she's unable to attend herself um, so so they're contacted by Kath uh, and then she devises a plan for them in conjunction with myself and, and our section leaders um, so what are we doing currently um, well um, we do a member attendance survey each week uh, and that survey includes things like are you planning to attend this week um, have you taken a lateral flow test? Um, that's not compulsory. You don't have to take a lateral flow to attend our rehearsal. Um, but there are other health questions on there. So if people are feeling a little bit under the weather, coughs and colds, that sort of thing, um, then they would put that on their survey. And then our chair lady, who's our point of contact for all this, will then say, well, actually, I think perhaps you shouldn't come this week. Um, rather than say you cannot attend this week. You know, it's all it's all a big trust thing really uh, and our chair to go back to what Delith was saying our chair lady is um, she is our point of contact for positive cases so if anybody does have a positive case immediately after a rehearsal they would tell Fliss who will then take any necessary steps um, moving forward um, we've modified our rehearsals so that we include more breaks we used to break at about 8 45 until 9 now we probably break about 8 15 and again around 9 ish and maybe again before we finish at 10 so we just have to I just have to read the room a little bit and see how the chorus is feeling um, and then we might take a few extra breaks we also have more times when sections aren't all singing together so we do lots of duetting at the moment which gives other sections chance to just sit down uh, or leave the room for a while whilst another section is singing uh, we're running section rehearsals under glass so I coach a section in front of the rest of the chorus which again enables three, three sections to just not sing for a while and just get some vocal rest. And they're going down quite well. Um, we've also been using a CO2 monitor. And here's where the science is baffling me a little bit, is that the levels drop when we sing. So when we arrive and we're doing the meet and greet and everyone's taking their seats and we're putting masks on and the windows are going open, our readings are around about 1200-ish. Um, and when we start to sing, they drop to about four to five hundred as we're singing. So that's a little bit of interesting science that maybe Emma or Alex could maybe explain to me a bit later on. Um, what are we doing? We, we've had two weeks where we've tried singing without masks and it was literally one song. Uh, and it was for those that, that felt safe to take a mask off, were invited to. Um, and... 
uh, and then cases around the Bristol area went up. Not not our fault, <laughs> but cases in the Bristol area went up. So since then, we haven't actually done any unmasked singing. The, the masks have stayed on. Um, what else? What else? Um, Oh yeah, quite an important thing for me as a director and as a teacher in that I, I, I include a bit of time to hear the thoughts of the membership. So how are you feeling about tonight's rehearsal? How is it going? Um, and what we found is that some of our longer songs and our more difficult songs, um, our members find it hard to sing more than once in a row. So what you know, rather than plow through a song and then think, right, let's work on this, 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 this and this, we might sing a song and then we might have to take a breather. We might have to take an actual break before I can then go back and work on it. Craig? Yes, Ali? Can I ask, is that because of the, the, the stamina of your singers has has dropped off? I think so. Lockdown? I think so, yeah. Maybe Debbie, you can chip in on that if you're happy to uh, as a singer in the chorus. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it is, it is hard work, but also our breathing behind a mask is not are easy so especially if you've got um an up tempo um to keep going and you know and breathe and sing all becomes a much more of an effort so yeah i think it's a combination of both um and actually on that we we haven't done any choreography at all so performance has completely taken a back step <laughs> um no, that doesn't mean performance. Well, we know that. Isn't choreo. I know we're singing judges, Craig. No, I have to. I have to see you here. I have to see you here. Order. 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 Choreography's been shelved, Alison. That's it. Choreography's gone. We, we literally stand. Oh, the performance here. continues to be a focus. But we might actually <laughs> smile. That's there. We go. Um, okay. So, um, I mean, I just did a quick calculation before I came on and our average attendance is around 70%. And I don't know what that compares to everybody else, but for us, that's actually pretty good. Um, and as a director, I'm, I'm happy with that. 70% is pretty good. Um, so, you know, we as a team and I as an MD can only offer so much support. You know, if, if people can take us up on the support and they feel safe, then, then great. Uh, and if they can't, then that's also great you know if they you know, as long as they're still members of the club and they still feel valued which i hope they do um then as far as i'm concerned we're, we're doing a, a pretty good job as musical leaders i think you're absolutely right and i just throw my experience into the ring with this as well in that we've done taken a slightly different approach we did do all the outside rehearsals we didn't do them as sections we did them as the chorus outside once you could have um, 20 people mm. I think it was 20 um, and not that many people actually wanted to come and that was all socially distanced and outside um, but then when we went back inside we've never asked for masks but we have asked for a lateral flow um, and because we did it right from the start everybody's been absolutely fine about it you know taking the lateral flow registering it and showing the proof to our health and safety officer who has health and safety qualifications and has been really, really hot on it all. Um, and very, very supportive through the whole process. But like you say, it's in, you know, we're still Zooming as well. And we have one camera on me and one camera on the chorus um, so that the people at home, if they're isolating or they can't come or they've got a bit of a sniffle, yeah. you know, can still feel part of it. Um, yeah, I think that and we have lost members as everybody. We lost some in lockdown and then some since subsequently since we've um, actually started to put them on the spot a little bit and said, look, what do you want to do? You know, because they have people who hadn't attended Zoom or anything. Um, and a few of them have gone, actually, no, I'm, I'm not coming back. And a couple have stayed on sabbatical, but yeah, just trying that forever balancing act of keeping everybody. We've um, um, we've lost we've lost a couple actually, but we've also we've also gained a couple, uh, and it's I think probably thanks to to labs and doing all these amazing convention videos that we can share that has encouraged a few people to sort of either come back or to find barbershop mm. for the first time. 
So that's that's yeah for us. That's really good. Okay, thank you then, Mike. If you could put us back onto gallery view. If I, I did. I think you did. Off, I think you have to take yourself off. Remember. Okay, about I've this. done it. So we've thank had you. a few questions in the chat, and Delith and um, Emma and Alex have added information into the chat, which you should be able to copy and paste out if you want to keep it, or maybe we can save the chat and send it around after. But are there any questions? Other questions? May, may, I, yeah, there's, yeah, there may is, I chip yeah. in? Yes. Um, so um, I've just been reading the chat. I think, Mike, you're probably about to say exactly the yes. same thing that I'm do, doing. As I'm looking through the chat, um, thanks to Alex for uh, recommending a carbon dioxide budget. And there's a very valid question there, Alex, about what um, you know what you know when should it start to ping and when should you call it a night and then i think craig you also made the point that it's interesting that the carbon dioxide level seems to go down as you move into the rehearsal and i just wanted to put in a little bit of experience that i've had because in the classroom we all have carbon dioxide monitors in, in our classrooms and um and the we had some government guidance recently about about classroom levels of carbon dioxide and the and alex correct me if i'm wrong but the, the classrooms um, it was 800 parts per million is, is seen as a kind of a, a threshold above which you should actually be, um, you know, getting out for a little while or, or whatever. And we've got obviously science classrooms it's slightly differently because we've actually got quite good ventilation in our science classrooms. And we do start off at a, a threshold of around about seven to 800 every morning. But as you say, what is interesting is when I've got 30 kids in there with all the windows open, and people chatting and everything it actually does go down and i think it's because of having lots of people in the room lots of ventilation and, and actually the ventilation takes a little while to kick in so you know 1200 when you when you come into a closed room and then as you open all the windows and people actually start moving around and causing turbulence in the in the airflow within the room and they're breathing and they're talking which is also adding to that turbulence and it does actually go down that's my observation as well which you know might feel contrary to the fact that we're all dishing out four percent carbon dioxide every time we take a breath but actually it does seem to it seems to support the ventilation rather than diminish it alex would you agree with that yes absolutely and, that, and that's pretty much exactly the point that i was going to make that the, the reason that i would imagine bf's um bristol fashions um venue starts off at 1200 is because the the windows and doors have been closed for the last few hours before you start your rehearsal and then the first thing you guys do when you get in is open the windows and then you have warm bodies that then encourage air out of the room as well um so yeah the, the question um what to do if the monitor does start to go ping and we've kind of uh, i've encountered it almost getting to that level um where the venue that one of um one of the choruses that i sing with um they have really good ventilation when it's on and then at one point in the night it switched off and we have this lovely level kind of 550 550 550 then we heard this kind of and all of the system shut off and it just then ticked up and got up to 780 handily that was when we had planned to have a break anyway but um we then left the room and saw um saw the levels dissipate again so um uh, my advice would be if the levels do creep up and the machine starts complaining at you that is when that is a good opportunity for an outside break <laughs> um yeah question from fiona in the chat which is a technical question which relates mm -hmm. to um the co2 monitor with yep. a non-dispersive infrared sensor she heard that, mm -hmm. that might have been best and yes is that first of all correct and secondly yes. is is that might be useful for people who are looking for a slightly lower cost option is how do you yeah. feel about that Alex? yeah so ndir so non-dispersive infrared um that's what my research group used that type of sensor for monitoring co2 from reactions so it is good enough for industrial chemists, so oh. it's good enough for us. So it is the top of the, um, it is what we, you would use. Um, and if your thing says it's NDIR, that probably means it's a decent enough detector. Um, is there anything the, basically, the way that it works is it, 
it, it shires it, it basically it um shines an infrared beam like comes out of your um uh tv remote and it measures the intensity of that beam and um given and it's a very particular energy kind of you know your microwave works by um kind of heating up just the water by shining just that level of radiation that's how your microwave works and it, you have a similar effect going on with this infrared radiation where it measures the amount of co2 okay um, through that okay. i sorry. think that that's enough <laughs> That's enough that science. So Sorry. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> never had enough time. You, you might begin to lose the room, but somebody Sorry. has asked, where's the best place to position the CO2 monitor? Good question. Um, I've, as, as Craig said, we've placed, I've, I've tried putting it everywhere. Um, the place where I felt like it's giving the most relevant reading is kind of just in front of the director. But sort of between um, the director and the chorus? Between the director and the chorus. Yeah, I guess that would if be there's the anywhere spot. where stuff is going to build up is there. OK, thank you. Um, and we've got somebody asking. So this is back to masks. Um, have Has anyone had members that are exempt from wearing masks if you're asking people to wear masks? But so they've got a medical exemption. And how do you deal with that? I just put, they just... might be the people not coming to the chorus rehearsal I'm, I'm just putting something in the chat about that it's, it's less about the person who's exempt from wearing a mask or actually hasn't had any jabs at all uh, and to mm. me it's much more about what the other people who are going to be in the room think about that um, I would be very very unhappy to be in a room with somebody who had not been jabbed um, if somebody was not going to wear a mask I'd keep my distance from them um, but I think you, you need to keep a weather eye on those people, um, but both the people who are particularly vulnerable and the people who would react to the people who are particularly vulnerable. Yeah. Um, and the, the least you can ask, I think, is that somebody who has neither been vaccinated nor is willing to wear a mask is that they take a PCR or an LFT test on the day of your rehearsal stroke performance and only come if it's negative yeah so that that's what that's what we're doing as i said um craig just to, just to sort of share uh, my own experience on that Delith. um i've this week had a member say that she's not going to come to rehearsal probably until the new year because she's previously had treatment for uh, cancer and she doesn't feel that the vaccination is particularly going to help her general health as she's been told by her medical team that actually the vaccine could uh, react badly to previous treatment but she has taken the decision to stay on zoom and actually over this weekend she's been one of the most verbal members of our whatsapp group watching all the videos and stuff um and um so yeah so but she has taken herself out of the equation i suppose is what i'm trying to say she hasn't been told Oh, you can come, but you have to stand in a corner or everyone's going to stand away from you. She's just used a bit of common sense and sort of thought, well, yeah, OK, this is my issue. I'm taking it up on myself and I'm taking myself out of the equation. And I think that's a great situation. To be I, wonder, I think that's really sensible. I'm wondering if other choruses have actually asked about vaccinations, because I don't actually know. I'm assuming my chorus are vaccinated, but I don't we know. Asked. We haven't asked. No. Emma's got a question then, Craig, if he's not. If he's it's, it's just to chip in on this part of the conversation. Um, the There's kind of two aspects to think about. And I'm very aware that within this forum, I'm not wearing my Labs Music's Judge hat. Mm. I am wearing my Assistant Director of a Chorus hat and I'm wearing my I Work for HSE hat. OK, so and I'm coming from two two angles here. So in terms of um, what both Delith and Craig have just described, a lot of that is going to be about communication and it's about appropriate communication. What a lot of this will all come down to is about talking to each other in a timely fashion and in an appropriate fashion. Um, in terms of asking your chorus if they've been vaccinated um, or if they're going to do LFTs or if they don't want to do that, what is the options? Um, what we've done in my chorus um, and bearing in mind, my chorus isn't a member of labs, we're a member of Sweet Ads, but we've had all the same discussions um, we 
Our chorus did a survey before doing any form of return to live singing, including outdoors. So this was back pre-summer. Mm -hmm. um, and then as vaccines were being rolled out, another survey was done to see if uh, you know, percentages of chorus on first vaccine, second vaccine, because obviously a lot of choruses have wide demographic and the older demographic um, got priority over the younger demographic. We've got 16 year olds in our chorus um, who I don't think have been jabbed yet. Um, and then we've got our older members who are now hitting their booster vaccinations as well. So again, it's all about the communication because our management team who are, in our case, because we're a charity, they are the trustees of the group and under charity law, they have a duty of care and that includes health and safety and also the Equality Act. Wow. So it's, it's the constant communication and the being open and having those, making sure that those conversations are happening across the piece and not relying on one person to pass on a piece of information because there you have a single point of failure. And what you don't want is a single point of failure. You need to make, make sure that your communications are, are nicely interlinked and locked. That was slightly waffly, but I hope you got what I meant. Mm, definitely. Thank you, Emma. Yes, you did. Um, I wonder if uh, the people who are on the call could just, uh, wave if you've been asked if you've been vaccinated by your chorus I mean so not many not many no mm. I, mm. I think I, that we decided that to go the lateral flow route because that wasn't something anything really people could object to the tests are free I know that there there's um you know questions about how reliable they are, but we've all got that information that if you've got any symptoms at all, don't do a lateral flow, oh, book a are. PCR. <laughs> Never mind. Thanks, Sally. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the vaccination, you know, isn't something that is compulsory. We can't, you know, so... I don't know that was how that was how we felt about it and yeah like you said Emma and Craig we did surveys right way back when about how you felt about it and there were people who said you know I don't want to come back until we can rehearse in person I don't want to come back until I've had double vaccines and you know so I suspect all of my callers are vaccinated but I just yes, don't know Emma, Emma. I've forgotten what I was going to say. <laughs> I've remembered. I've remembered. I've remembered. Um, so at the risk of saying something possibly controversial, and, and this did cause a little bit of friction within my own chorus, um, every time we as a group hold a rehearsal, we are effectively holding an event. Um, and that's where we come under the guidance of the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. And what I would just like to highlight is there is a lot of fantastic guidance and it is a lot there's pages and pages and pages and pages of it um, the stuff that we have from making music and other such organizations is an interpretation of the guidance that is issued by central government so be aware of that do make sure you read the actual guidance given out as well because you may interpret it differently um, event management that's it so effectively what we're talking about all through this is event safety management and if you have if you're entering a venue in order to carry out an event you are subject to the conditions of hire of that venue and they like somebody said previously they will probably have already they may already have their own risk assessment and protocols in place for the situation that we have at the moment they may not so that may be down to you to do for your own event um, but in terms of conditions of entry for your event your conditions of entry can be whatever you want them to be if you want somebody to draw a picture of Mickey Mouse in order to be allowed into your rehearsal, then you can say, I want you to draw a picture of Mickey Mouse, otherwise you're not coming in. Now, how you communicate that with your group members and how you get people to buy into that, that's something else. But the condition of entry is whatever you want it to be. And if that's an LFT or a questionnaire or, we're, or a singer's mask or whatever, or drawing a picture of Mickey Mouse, it's all valid. That's right. Okay, thank you. I'll look forward to the pictures. Right. <laughs> um, Are there Fiona. any other questions yeah, that Fiona. I've missed in the chat? Um, well, and if not, any other questions from the floor? We're kind of sort of six minutes, seven minutes from wrap up. Um, Alison, Fiona has a question. Fiona. Thanks. Uh, Mike, your microphone's a bit quiet because I'm not sure everyone can hear you when you're jumping Th in there. Thanks, Fiona. Appreciate it. Um, 
Yeah, it was just a follow up to your point, Emma, because I, I feel like I'm probably on that side of things with you that we have a duty of care to our members. So if we feel that something's necessary, it's a requirement to attend, that we should be in the position to do that. But what's what's felt why we haven't maybe it made a lot of things like LFTs mandatory is because how that interacts with equality, diversion and diversity and inclusion because it is also people's choice it's their choice to not attend a rehearsal if they don't want to agree with the measures but it, it's how you I guess balance those two where you're not potentially discriminating against a certain group of people absolutely yeah absolutely and, and that's kind of where I said uh, um, it's it's a really fine line oh you've disappeared there's you <laughs> you were off in my top left hand corner and you've gone down to the bottom again Fiona um so yeah and that's where the fine line is it has to be walked and that's why the open lines of communication are so important so you know I'm, I'm looking at it I appreciate it through a polarized lens in some mm -hmm. respects um, so, and, and it's, it's what I think it might be a scientist -y thing. I don't know. I've got a set of rules and processes. And I'm a scientist as well. So. Oh. Welcome. <laughs> Anyone else? Us, Anyone else? Is it just, just us three? No, there oh, there yeah, isn't. Mike is as well. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Rachel. Marvellous. Yeah. Thank I you. work in the Department of Chemistry, but I'm a receptionist. Does that count? Oh, that counts. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Great. Love it. Um, <laughs> yes. No, you're absolutely right, Fiona. And and no, we can't discriminate. Um, and again, for those of us that are charities, we're governed by the um, Equality Act anyway. Um, and yes, there are going to be people who have exemptions. There are going to be people who, who can't have vaccines, who can't wear masks, and, and for various different reasons that we as all the members of the chorus don't need to know about, to be perfectly mm. honest. Yeah. And we have to trust and accept that um, our management team are doing what we need them to do. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm interested in, I understand that about the vaccinations, sorry, I'm getting all complicated, but is take asking somebody asking everybody to do an LFT is that a, against is that anti discriminatory is that discriminatory? You can't force it. No. You no. can ask it. I can ask it, but as you said, withdrawing the Mickey Mouse. If we ask it and they say no, then that's a, the condition of them coming to our chorus. Yeah, but you do fine. have to put other other measures in place in order to facilitate that member coming in if they're unable to do LFT. So Zoom would count. Well, Zoom counts, doesn't it? Yeah, they're still included, aren't they? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's <laughs> Thank quite important. You. In, 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 in my chorus, uh, just for adding this, we've been insisting, insisting, stating that we need to see proof of the LFT uh, just because we need to be sure. And also, people who've been doubly vaccinated have been getting COVID as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Loads. don't be hanging your hat on thinking that as long as I'm double jabbed, I'm like solid nonsense no, right no. so the thing is get tested we prefer it if it's on the day but you are, you're allowed to do it on the day before right and we even facilitate it by having some of the packs out yeah. on the desk at the rehearsal for those people who inadvertently got too busy forget they're running quickly and they arrive at rehearsal oh I forgot right so we, we facilitate that someone yeah. looks at the results you know look looks at the 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 and the uh, uh, nhs website uh, info to make sure that's all strict and it hasn't been messed about with and everybody's bought, bought into it because you tell people what you're doing and why yeah and 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 there's zoom available for those people who really really are not comfortable with even being anywhere near the area right and so yeah. somehow this keeps it it seems to be keeping it together okay it's, so okay Thank you, Mike. And I think that actually from what you've just said and what everybody's been saying, I really like Emma's point of keeping the communication open, oh. making sure that you're, that everybody is involved in the decisions, as you said, Craig, that everybody feels part of it. And that also, obviously, with the duty of care, all we want is for all of our singers to be safe. Um, uh, but I think highlighting that our duty of care in that phrase is a really useful thing to have as well. Are there any final points for any of our panelists before we wrap up this session? No, in which case I'd yes. like to thank, please. Debbie had a question. Oh, Sorry. beg your pardon, Debbie. Oh, that's okay. No, it was just really um, an observation, I guess, because um, COVID is gonna be with us for the long run now. Um, and I was really interested in what you had to say, Emma, about, um, you know, sort of uh, right of 
um, requirement for entry. I'm wondering if maybe in the future, um, the fact that we all now are so familiar with Zoom, that having Zoom could become a condition for members who you know, perhaps can't or won't come to, to rehearsal, but we would expect them to be on Zoom if they're not there in real life, maybe. Well, yeah, and, and that's something, again, it's all about discussing those possibilities with the members of the chorus. Like Mike has said, they facilitate those who've you know, forgotten to do an LFT before they've got there, they have spare packs available. My chorus has done exactly the same. If they can't do LFT, we have a questionnaire. We prefer the LFT because the questionnaire then brings in uh, issues with GDPR because you're, yes. um, withhold, you're holding personal data. Yeah. Um, and that brings a whole other minefield with it. Oh. Um, okay. but, but yes, the what we don't, like a lot of choruses, what we used to have was an insistence that, or an expectation, the chorus culture and expectation was you turn up on a Thursday night, regardless of whether you are coughing, spluttering, or you're at the top of your game. And what, what this pandemic, I think, has done for a lot of us is actually go, we don't want sick bay at chorus because wow. all it does is spread germs. Mm. But now we have a means to include those people, yeah. but without yeah. them being in the room. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah it, is. it means that your, your chorus can still progress as a group, yes. whether or not you're yeah. all in the same room on the same night. Yeah. And what it has shown is that it is possible. You can still have members of your chorus in the virtual sick bay partaking of whatever it is you're doing, whether it's on Zoom, whether it's on Podbean, whether it's on Jamulus, whatever, whatever you're using to facilitate that. The point is you are providing them with the option. You are giving them the op opportunity to do that. Yes, that's really important. <laughs> that's really important. We, we'd already said about before pandemic, please, if you've got a cold, don't come. We don't want it. No. no. Okay, we are really at the end of our, our allotted time. Yes, we, we weren't are. sure we'd get the need to carry on for the entire hour, but I, that was a really, really helpful session. I certainly found it yeah. extremely helpful. So can I just thank our primary panellists, though, of course, everybody's effectively been part of the panel. So thank you to Emma and to Alex and to Delith and to Craig and to Alison Zalowski for kicking us off. Mm -hmm. And to our Zoominators, Mike and Leanne, thank you very much, everybody. Brilliant. See you soon, hopefully thank you very much, folks. in person. Thank you.